Okay, I think we'll make a start. Um, welcome everybody to this evening's lecture by Lynn Butler from the University of Wolverhampton's School of Art, which is based at our city campus in Wolverhampton. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us tonight for Lynn's lecture. Uh, my name is Paula Harrison and I'm the coordinator at University Centre Telford. And for those of you who don't know, we are part of the University of Wolverhampton and we're based in the town of Telford, which is in the heart of Shropshire. Um, we normally run a public lecture programme throughout the year um, and we normally hold the lectures in our centre, which is on the third floor of the Southwater building, for those of you who know Telford. Um, but obviously because of the current pandemic, we've moved our lecture series online. Um, and I think we've hosted um, 10 lectures since mid-May, and we've got a few more planned for human resources and marketing. And also for those of you who've been in Louise Fenton's lectures, one more on zombies, um, just to add a bit more spice. Um, <laughs> all the lectures are recorded. Um, and some of the recordings are available on the Uni University Centre Telford YouTube channel um, for those who miss the lectures. Now, before I hand over to Lynn, I just wanted to explain that there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the lecture via the Q&A button. Um, and for those of you who are using a laptop or a desktop, um, that's on uh, the bottom of the screen in the middle. Um, and for those of you who are using a mobile, it will be in the top right hand corner. Um, so you can put your questions and answers on there. And I think Lynn is doing a poll as well. And um, the yes or no answers can go on there as well. But Lynn will explain that. Um, so we're delighted this evening to welcome Lynn Butler for her lecture on the truth about fake news alternative facts and how to spot them. Lynn has had a career in journalism spanning two decades. She started out as a print journalist with Trinity Mirror, now Reach PLC, um, but she's most recently worked as a freelance multimedia journalist for the BBC, ITV, Free Radio and Birmingham Live. She is a recent journalism graduate now teaching media and journalism within the university. So a very warm welcome to Lynn. Thank you very much um, for supporting our lecture series. And I'll hand over to you now. Thank you thanks very, very much. much. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Paula. And thanks so much, everyone, for, for uh, joining us this evening. I don't know if I can compete with zombies, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> I feel like I'm at a disadvantage already, but, but I'll do my best. Uh, <laughs> Right, okay, so uh, as I say, thanks very much for, for, for joining me this evening. And just to give you a little bit of information about what we'll be covering this evening, um, the areas we'll be looking at. Um, we'll be asking some questions which I think are deceptively basic, which is what is news? What is fake news? Why is fake news so, so prevalent? How and why it works? What the, um, I don't know, what the mechanics are that allow it to work? How we can spot and identify fake news. Um, we'll also look at trust in the media, how that's changed and perhaps how the pandemic is perhaps changing that, that level of trust again. And then we'll finish off with a, with a question and answer. Um, with regards to the question and answer, that is going to be at the end, but if you think of questions kind of as we go through the lecture, just jot anything in the sort of question and answer section and then Paula will pick those up and we'll go through them at the end. So if something suddenly springs to mind that you want to ask me about, then please feel free to do that as we as we go along. And first of all, I just wanted to start with how I've approached the subject of fake news. Um, as Paula said, I've got some quite substantial experience um, in journalism, starting as a print journalist, a role which doesn't even exist anymore uh, in the present climate, I've ended up as a multimedia journalist. So when I started out, we had readers, we now have an audience. Um, and to me, that suggests that there's more of a kind of an entertainment value in what we, what we do to keep people interested. Um, and I've seen huge changes in journalism, both from my role where I started out, if I was going to do an interview, I'd simply interview someone and take a pen and paper with me. Whereas now if I'm, even if I'm working for radio, I've got to write an article, 
uh, record part of a bulletin and then perhaps also make video content as well. Um, and I've also seen changes in the way that, that people consume news and also their attitudes towards it. And that moves me on to behaviour because the next thing I want to look at is, is, is online behaviour specifically. Um, how people react to stories, what they think of stories, how they spread them. And, and finally, I'm going to introduce some theory. Um, so these are theorists who might not necessarily have been writing about fake news, but I feel as though their, their work really sheds some light into how, uh, into the mechanics of fake news and how it actually works. And the first thing I wanted to look at is, is just going a bit more in depth into what I mentioned about the changes that I've seen in journalism over the past couple of decades. Um, so traditionally, audiences were receivers of news. It was kind of a um, deliveries vertical. So you've got publishers, journalists, editors at the top. And then we disseminated the news to an audience that was largely passive and, and anonymous. And that was known as one to many. So you've got the one at the top spreading the, the news out to people. So there was a tight control of kind of the news agenda of what people read. But now in a digital age, we can all be publishers. Um, and that's, so that's really changed the power that audiences have, power over what they share amongst themselves, but also amongst what we, what we produce as journalists. So now the news spreads horizontally as well as vertically through social media. You now, once upon a time, you might read a great story. Who would you tell about that story? You could tell people down the pub. To my editor, that was the ultimate with a great story. If you write a story and people are talking about it in the pub, then that's then you've achieved your aim. Whereas now, you know, we want clicks and shares and likes. Um, so we now have rather than one to many, it's many to many, and everything spreads kind of horizontally. Now, there's two ways of looking at this. You could say it's a new democracy of information. Information is no longer tightly controlled by the people at the top, spreading it down. We can actually share information amongst ourselves, perhaps people who wouldn't have had a voice in traditional journalism or traditional newspapers can now have their say because they can not only share things but publish things themselves. So it makes the dissemination of news easier but it also makes the dissemination of fake news easier. So just some, some quick figures and some, some details about fake news at the moment. Um, so Loughborough University uh, carried out some research in 2018 and the results of that, they found that four in 10 people pass on fake news via social media. And some of those people actually know that it's fake. People can use fake news either to annoy people as a joke. Um, but you've got, so that's, you know, almost half of people on social media are, are passing it on. And um, another survey in America found that actually a false story reaches people six times quicker than a true story. And we'll look at the reasons behind that, but it can be that quite often a false story, um, a fake news story is much more shareable because it's designed to be, it's designed to tap into certain things that makers want to share it, that makers have a good reaction to it. And bringing us right up to date, Ofcom have uh, carried out a survey into the effects of COVID-19 on the media and Ofcom are uh, the regulators of, um, of broadcasting and newspapers um, in, in, in the UK. They found that half of all UK adults exposed to, uh, exposed to false claims about COVID-19. So that's around about 26 million people, 26 million adults in the UK have seen fake news. So for instance, there's one story about if you drink a lot of water, it can kind of flush it out of your system. 35% of UK adults have seen that story. That's something like 18 million people have been exposed to it. And it's sort of touching on that, how fake news now can actually affect people's lives in, in various ways. This is a quote from a charity called uh, Full Fact. Um, they will be talking about them a bit more later, but they actually, um, they fact check information. There's a growing number of these fact checking sites now because of the proliferation of, of fake news. Um, but they say bad information ruins lives. It promotes hate, which is something we'll look at shortly. Um, it damages people's health, and I think we can see that with um, the amount of fake news that there is around COVID-19 and, and also the confusion that there is around even the official advice. And it also hurts democracy. 
And there's a particular example that I want to share about that, which is not, it wasn't a story about how much Hillary Clinton likes pizza. Um, I'm also quite worried that by including a picture of pizza, you're all going to rush off and eat some pizza. But please, please, if you can stay, that would be good. Um, so Pizzagate was a story that went viral. In other words, it was shared thousands and thousands of times online in 2016 in the run up to the 2016 US uh, presidential election. And it was a story that kind of stemmed both um, on Facebook and also through the hacking of, a, um, of her email account that found that she was arranging, uh, one of her meetings was being arranged at a pizza restaurant in Washington called Comet Ping Pong was the name of the restaurant. And somehow some kind of different elements of fake news came together to say that she was actually running a child human trafficking ring from that restaurant. And this was picked up by uh, bots, Russian bots, which are kind of um, an application that can pick up news, can make it look credible and then can share it via various social media platforms. And even though when you look at that story and it, it sounds completely ridiculous, it was shared thousands and thousands of times. And there were claims that it actually could have cost her um, the election, that story, which was completely fabricated apart from the fact that she was having a meeting at that pizza restaurant. A further uh, development that came from that was that a, a, someone who, who believed this story was true actually went to that restaurant later in the year and opened fire with an automatic weapon in, in that restaurant. Unfortunately, no, nobody was injured. But that is as a result of these kind of stories that can just gain so much momentum and cause such strong feelings in people. And again, we'll be looking at why that is a little bit later. So one thing to me that's quite clear is that, that fake news results in fake democracy. And I think, you know, if that, um, if that story about Hillary Clinton did have that impact, then that clearly was the result. But what I also wanted to look at uh, before we move on is, is, is democracy and, and news and fake news. And with regards to Donald Trump, he uses the word fake news a lot. In fact, I had a look at his Twitter account and he's actually used the word fake in relation to fake news, fake news media. Um, he's used that over a thousand times since the beginning of 2017. That's around once a day. And he's got 82 million followers on Twitter. So you can see that there's this kind of, um, this kind of erosion of trust. And then also thinking back to that Hillary Clinton story, you've got stories that are clearly false. And then we've got stories that are genuine, but if if Trump or, or particular followers don't like that story, then they also class it as, as, as fake news. So the loss of the news is actually losing its meaning um, from my perspective. And the result of this, the result of this kind of confusion over news and fake news and what news actually represents and what it's for, results in figures like this. 42% of Republicans say accurate news stories that cast a politician in a negative light are fake news. So basically now it's got to the point where fake news is just something that you don't like. Um, which is why I actually don't like the term fake news, even though I used it for the, the title of this lecture. I actually think disinformation is, is more accurate, where you've got information that could be partly true, but is misleading. Um, so what I'm actually kind of working my way towards is that through fake news, the use of this word fake, the fact that I think it's quite interesting with Donald Trump because I think years ago before he was a politician, he was quite popular with the media. And then I think he became like a little bit corny and they kind of turned on him a little bit. And I think by the time that he was into politics, people were a lot more critical of him, which of course they should be. Um, but I think he struggled with that. And I think that's why he, he struggles to understand that the media isn't just there to make him look good. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about now is actually the role of the news media. And as someone who's not only been a journalist, but, but studied journalism and the purpose of journalism, journalism, there is a normative theory of journalism, which is what it's actually for and what it should do. Um, and I really like this quote from, from a journalist here called Shudson. Uh, he says, the news media should serve society by informing the general population in ways that arm them for vigilant citizenship. So the purpose of journalism is to, is to arm you with the information that you need in order for democracy to work, in order for you to make informed decisions. That's the role of the news media. You know, it's not there um, 
to make people look bad, to make people look good, to make us feel smug if we agree with it. Um, but I think the way that social media works and the way that we can pick and choose what we look at, I think this role of news media is really confused and is, is, is lost now. Um, and I think it's quite hard for some people to realise that the, the media is not the enemy. I mean, there are various reasons why this normative theory of journalism is difficult to achieve. Um, and there's a whole other lecture about, you know, <laughs> the arguments there uh, about how ideology affects it. But um, and also I think it's quite important to there's a there's a, a journalist, a, a British journalist called Tony Harkup, who's written uh, extensively about journalism. And he sees it as a giant mirror reflecting society. So. Journalism isn't meant to make us feel comfortable. Journalism turns the mirror on, on us. And we have to look at ourselves and we have to face uncomfortable truths. For instance, at the moment in the UK, we've got issues around um, racial discrimination within police forces, within other organisations, and that's uncomfortable to see. Um, and also there's been recently, again in the UK, um, issues over some medical procedures that, that, that women have undergone and complained about and said that they'd left them in agony and those women's concerns were ignored. And again, that's, that's very difficult for people to come to terms with and to face. And in a society where we're so used now, to, as I say, to picking and choosing what we read and don't read, it is, for, it is easy for this, this normative theory and the purpose of journalism um, to, to be lost. And so um, what we're going to talk about now is what news is. So every person that you ask, every journalist that you ask, every media theorist that you ask, they're all going to have a different definition of news. But I really like this. Um, definition and these characteristics that are identified by another um, British journalist and author called Andy Ball. So it's new. So it hasn't got to, the story hasn't got to be new, but it's got to be new to you. It could have been something that's happened years ago and it's just come to light. So it's new to you. It adds to your knowledge of the world. You've, you've gained some information. You've gained some knowledge that you didn't have before. It's about people. So you've probably heard of human interest stories. You'll struggle to find a story that isn't about people. Even on the surface, it might see, not seem to be about people, but there will be heart of, people at the heart of that story. Um, because what people are interested in is stories that affect them or affect other people or affect other people like them. And this leads on to me talking about the, the kind of relevance to audiences. Now, every story isn't going to be relevant to everybody. But if you read... Um, now, if you're interested in computer games and there's a, there's a website that has a list of new computer games that are coming out and reviews, and that's going to be of interest to you. So you're going to want to read the story. And not in all cases, but it's probably going to be dramatic or out of the ordinary. That's what editors love, especially in, the, in this day where there's so much digital media. You want, a, you want a story that's dramatic or different so that people are more likely to click on it, to spend more time reading it, to share it. And then finally, it's, it's factual. Um, and that's really important and I think there are allegations against journalists and the mainstream media for uh, publishing fake news but I think it's really important to remember that, that the, the mainstream news media we are accountable we're accountable for what we do as individuals as companies as editors we are accountable so it's, it's in our interests to to be factual um, and so you can take any, any news story and you can apply these, I think, these five characteristics. So this is a story about um, a freelance sports commentator called Andy Cotter. And when lockdown happened, he could no longer carry out his, his, his freelance role because there were no sporting events for him to commentate on. So instead, he started commentating on his dogs, on his dogs going swimming, on his dogs kind of fighting over a bone or a toy. Um, and from that, this, this kind of news story uh, appeared uh, about how he's now landed a book deal. And I think there might be a TV series. So we can see it's a new story. It's just happened. There's a date on it here because it's the 27th of June. So when I looked at it, it had just happened. It's new. We didn't know about this before. It's about people. It's about a person who hasn't been able to work in lockdown. And then this, this, this has happened to him. He's suddenly got this kind of almost new career. It's surprising. It's someone who was just posting little films about his dogs and now he's got a book deal and maybe a TV series from it. 
um, it's of interest to people because people will have been perhaps watching his videos online. There'll also be a lot of people who will be in the same boat where they've been freelancing, they haven't been able to work during lockdown, so they'll, they'll also find that of interest. And it's factual. And we know it's factual because um, we can see there's a picture of him. We know that's him. If we click, there's, there are links that you can click on to see his kind of media profile and you can see the videos. So there we go. That's, that's an example of a, of a news story. Um, <clears throat> now, if we compare that to fake news, so th this, is, this is kind of my definition of what, what I think constitutes fake news and, and um, what, what, what characteristics you'll find. So it's inaccurate. Um, so by inaccurate, I don't mean that like as a journalist, you make mistakes and it is awful and it is the worst thing, especially when I was a print journalist, because if you make a mistake, it was there forever. Um, unless you go through every individual newspaper and try and cross it out or something, it's going to be in library archives, it's going to be in people's homes, it's everywhere and it is, it is the worst situation to be in. Um, but this is, um, what I'm talking about here is inaccuracy that is also misleading. So, so it can be... Um, Perhaps taking a story that's true and then twisting it. It's also designed to disrupt. So there may be a major news story. It may be, it might have political leanings one way or another. And then you may have a group of people who are leaning another way politically and they will want to disrupt that story, discredit it some, somehow. Um, probably most importantly with fake news is it, it feeds into biases. So it will make you have a gut reaction to it. You'll be angry. Um, you want to click it, share it, you want to talk about it. And it's often created for profit or gain. Now that could be financial. If there's a story and you click on it and someone's getting paid per click, then you know someone could be gaining financially from that story. Um, but it also could be for, as we saw with the Hillary Clinton story, it was in the Russian, interest of the Russians to uh, discredit her because they thought Trump was their, was their friend. So they, they, there's some kind of political gain there. Um, so I'm just going to go on to discuss a post now from Facebook. Now there's nothing, um, there's no kind of uh, imagery that's particularly uh, explicit in the next uh, next slide, but it does involve um, a terror attack uh, in the UK and it does talk about the death of, of someone, but there are no uh, sort of photographs of that person. So just a, <clears throat> a warning if that's something that, that you might find difficult to look at. Um, so this is a story that someone shared with me. Um, was shared on my on my Facebook feed. Um, this is a story that involved um, a royal fusilier called Lee Wigby, who was murdered in in 2013 in the street in London by two Islamic extremists who were later um, jailed for life. And this story uh, is about how a memorial has been laid to him, um, but now the council are, are digging it up. So it's not true. The story isn't true. Um, what you're looking at is a plaque that was laid without the family's permission. And the family wanted um, an official memorial, but they didn't want this plaque. Um, so the story is, is, is false, but it's also misleading. It's kind of saying, well, the council don't care. He's, he's kind of forgotten. No one's interested in him anymore. And from that, from, from my perspective, I can see that this is, it's disruptive and it's also feeding into biases and it's disruptive because this story is two years old, but it's suddenly reappeared and it's reappeared around the Black Lives Matter movement. And I see this as being designed to disrupt the Black Lives Matter movement in that you've got an inference here that he is forgotten, that he is in London, which is multicultural that white lives aren't as important and then that's feeding into the biases of people who online you've got a kind of a an all lives matter movement kind of attacking the, the black lives matter movement and so this this has kind of reappeared um, so it's quite covert rather than overt it's kind of linking to that and so the gain that's being made here is it's disrupting the black lives matter movement it's disrupting that that narrative that's saying you know yeah, I find it, you know, it's quite, um, it's 
it's quite a sensitive issue, but I, I see it as, as kind of being there to sort of disrupt. But I think it's done in quite a subtle way because there's no direct link here or no immediate link with the Black Lives Matter movement. But I'm certain that that's why it suddenly reappeared at this point. But what I wanted to show you and what I think is interesting is that that post also has all the characteristics of Andy Ball's um, news definition. It's new. If this comes up on your post, it's new to you. Also, the way that it's written, um, the stone was laid on Friday night. Well, if you're reading that, you're going to think, well, that, that was last Friday. This, this is just happening. This is happening now. Um, it's about people. It's about a soldier, a father who lost his life on, on the street. Um, it's shocking. His, his death was shocking. And also the fact that if this, if this is being removed, um, that, that would be shocking. If he's perhaps if you know his family were, were did did place it there, um, it's of interest. It's going to be of interest to people whose biases it feeds into. And then also elements of it are true. That's that's a real image. Lee Rigby was a real person. You know that 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 stone there is real. So hopefully you can start to see how confusion can start to build up around what is fake and what is real and I mentioned about um, not really calling it fake news I know I use that for the title of the, of the lecture because I think it's the shorthand that we're familiar with but really it's more on the level of, of disinformation where you've got the real and the fake and you kind of mix them together and I really like um, a quote from a Slovenian philosopher you may have seen him Slavoj uh, Žižek he sometimes crops up on uh, Channel 4 News in the UK. Um, he says the most dangerous fake news is a lie that relies on true facts. Because when you, take these tr when you take these elements that are real, you can feed into people's biases about things they, they believe to be real. And then it gets so confusing. It makes it newsworthy. It lends the fake news credibility. And this is where it becomes really difficult to to identify fake news that's what i wanted to go on to talk about now and there are kind of four main ways that i found that you can kind of identify it which is to consider that, that i'll go through these in more detail but to consider the source and the author how does it make you feel does it make you angry does it make you cross does it make you happy images can can you believe what you're actually looking at and also the use of fact checking websites which have said are becoming more proliferant now so if you look at the source and the author, you want to think, is the author credible? What's their attitude? For instance, if you look at that Lee Rigby post, if you go to look at other things that person has posted, there are some quite unpleasant racist, um, there's some quite unpleasant racist material that they've shared. There's some stuff about this kind of all lives matter movement. There's a lot of very sort of patriotic stuff on there. Um, so you can kind of start to gauge, well, what kind of biases does this person have? Um, you can also Google the story. So for instance, that story about Lee Rigby, if you Google it, you'll find it's nowhere because it hasn't happened because it's not, it's not a new story. It's just an image that has then had some, some text tagged to it, making, some, making a claim. Um, and you can also click away from the story to explore more. So for instance, if it's on a news site. So for example, we can not only find fake news on, on social media, but we can also find it on sites like this one, uh, which is a US site called Infowars. Now, on the surface, it, it looks like a genuine news, news site. It uses kind of shorthand that you would see, visual shorthand for a news site. You know, you've got your various bits along the top, uh, news videos, breaking news. Um, you can watch videos. They've got little features. Um, but it's not a news site. It's, it's opinion. It's an opinion site. Um, because you'll quite often find articles that might have some sort of basis in truth, but then you'll have the, the author of that piece who will put in their, their own spin and their own perspective. And if you ever see stories like that, they're not news, they're opinion. And, then, and if they're not marked clearly as being opinion pieces, then you're probably looking at something that, that's fake news and that you can't have confidence in believing. So how does it make you feel? I think it's really important going on to that, going back to that biases. So if it makes you really angry, it's probably designed to do that so that, that you'll click and share and comment and engage with it and spread it. But we need to stop and think and say, actually, 
is it is this really likely to be true or is this just feeding into something that i want to believe is this feeding into something that i agree with um so for instance there's another post here from from facebook which um was around the subject of, of brexit and it was a uh, demonstration by remain campaigners who wanted to remain within the eu um so we've got two, a couple of pictures here one of people burning a flag uh setting fire to a flag and another of uh of protesters uh burning the union flag so this is designed it's fake and i'll go into a moment go into a moment in more detail about how we know it's fake um but if you are a pro brexit if you are you know patriotic something like seeing someone burning a flag can obviously um spark quite a strong reaction in you and you can see here there's a number of like angry face angry face kind of emojis there 300 people have kind of engaged with it 275 people have made comments 200 people have shared it and this was this is from someone who hasn't got a lot of um, friends on facebook they've got quite a small you know quite a small account but it still had this impact and this is just one person sharing it so i'm going to look at images and we'll go back to that that post that i've just looked at so if an image is going viral, just the same as a story, you have to think, does, does it make sense? And we'll look at that Im those two images again in a moment. And also, what's the image quality like? If it's poor, or maybe it's been sort of tampered with. You know, years ago, 20, 30 years ago, you think of the technology that you would have had to have to manipulate an image, whereas now you can do it in seconds on your phone. Um, also, check the comment section, because in there, there might be people saying, well, actually, this image isn't real. Or there might be people saying, actually this image is real you know you can, you can kind of have a look through the comment section and kind of gauge people's responses to it and you can also use image searching tools for instance as Go if you use google chrome if you right click on an image and do a, an image search it will actually show you the original of that image and it may be that it's quite different to the one that you're looking at on facebook or you might be able to see that it's been kind of tampered with and i'll show you where you can find more information um, on how to use these kind of tools uh, in a bit so if you go back to these two images, what I found interesting about the first one, and I didn't spot it for a while, is that it actually looks to me like that's not the Union flag. That actually looks to me like the Confederate flag. Um, you know, it can be a statement of Southern pride in the US, but it's also got connotations with um, racism and slavery. Um, so to me, that looks like it's a Confederate flag, but it's quite difficult to spot that, especially if you're looking at it on your phone. It's kind of small. Um, it's an easy detail to miss because you, you just see someone burning a flag. And then we've got this image of um, these people burning a flag here at this Remain march. And you have to think, well, actually, does, does this image make sense? Because why would Remain campaigners be burning the Union flag? There are lots of people around there. There are lots of Union flags. They're not being burnt. The woman who's, I think, protesting against them, I think she's a, um, she, I think she's a Leave campaigner. He's very close to that, <laughs> very close to that flag. She doesn't seem particularly worried. Um, so the image doesn't really make sense. And the reason that it doesn't make sense is that it's not real. Um, that flag is actually taken from a video of a protest in, in Argentina where we're clearly um, not very popular. Um, so you can see here, they basically reversed, reversed the image. And then this woman is, I think she's kind of pointing, but they put the, uh, they put the flag into her hand. But when you're looking at that, when you're scrolling through, when it's quite small on your phone and it, it looks convincing, but it doesn't make sense. And the reason that I knew that that was fake was actually through the use of a, a, a fact checking site in the UK called, um, called Full Fact. And there are other sites in the US, I think there's Snopes and uh, Fact Check. Which are, which are sites in the, in the US, which are also very good. So this is a UK charity. It's completely independent. It's kind of partisan, uh, hasn't got any affiliations with political parties. And it analyzes hundreds of news stories, statistics and political claims every year, and also provides guidance on fact checking. Um, and it's also a useful tool in sort of challenge, challenging disinformation as well, because if you find a, a, a story that you believe is fake, and I've done this, um, I found one about how the Lord's Prayer isn't allowed to be um, published on Facebook and then you get lots of people publishing the Lord's Prayer and they're never taken down so it's clearly not true but I was able to, uh, um, someone that I knew on Facebook who had published something about that, I was able to put the full fact link and go actually this is fake news um, so I think it's quite important to actually 
not just ignore it but kind of engage with the person that's posting it and saying well here's here's independent verification that that what you're spreading isn't actually true um, and so for example with the uh, the flag story so i just typed in burning flag because I, I i was suspicious of the of the image and then uh, came up with this which is this this picture of, of remains supporters burning a flag is fake and then if you were to scroll down you'd see there's lots of information about why it's fake how they proved it was fake where the original image is from so it's a very useful site and then what's even more heartening is when you go to facebook now this is what you see okay you get this this kind of um banner kind of over the post um saying that this is false information giving you more information I think there's some controversy about whether these posts should be taken down altogether or whether they should be left. But I think doing it this way, I think is, is, is really good because it does show people um, what fake news looks like, what it can look like and how you can sort of be fooled. And really, you've got to kind of engage with this in order to find out more about it. You've got to click through, but it's just as easy to click, you know, and see why and kind of have a look at that. And it's also quite quite heartening is if you look at the comments, there's someone here saying it's, it's photoshopped. And I think if you go down further, there are people sharing Again, the full fact um, link. But I also wanted to think about going back to this image. Why, why do we believe this? There's something to me. There's something else going on, and it's not just about the fact that it looks a little bit like news and that we have biases. To me, there's almost like a um, something happens to us when we're online, um, and it's to do with our brains, I think. Um, or more specifically the effect that the internet has on us when we're when we're when we're scrolling through stuff when we're online in fact you know since we've started using the internet um, researchers have been looking at the at its effect on our brains you know and there's a large body of evidence to suggest that it does change the way in which we process information uh, and there's an argument that uh the internet induces kind of superficial understanding the way that we engage with it so i'm just going to talk about that a little bit more so i think there's a comment here that kind of sums it up really which is uh, when we go online we enter an environment that promotes cursory reading hurried and distracted thinking and superficial learning and i don't think i could agree with that more really sometimes i think we do it as a distraction i think and there and distractions are really important but i think we do kind of go into a different state a different place when we go online um and this is a statement from an author and a journalist called nicholas carr and i can't um i can't say enough good things about the book that he wrote 10 years ago which is called the shallows um which was uh, shortlisted for the pulitzer prize and in that book, he brought together a lot of research about how the internet is changing how we think and learn and remember. Uh, and the title relates to us moving from the depths of thought, reading a book, spending a lot of time reading and then thinking, and then moving more to the sort of shallows of distraction, so the shallows of, of the internet, the shallows of being online and uh, just mentally being in a different place. And he wrote this book um, and, and drew research from before disinformation and fake news were, were, were a pro thought to be a problem or were terms that were widely used. But I think that the work that he pulled together um, and the conclusions that he came to really um, tap into to, to why fake news is so, um, so widespread. And what he kind of says is that the internet engages most of our senses at the same time, apart from sort of smell and taste. So we're tapping on keys, we're dragging a mouse, we're swiping, we're completely oblivious to everything else around us. We're kind of, we're completely consumed. And we're also in this kind of high speed system where we get responses and rewards. And I think that's, uh, that's really interesting. We look at, you know, you look something up online, and then you want to look something else up and then you get a result, you look something else up, you get another result. And we're constantly kind of moving forward, getting these little bits of information that we want and then moving on and wanting more information. Or for instance, sort of scrolling through Instagram and it, it's never enough. And I know sometimes you can just find yourself endlessly scrolling. Um, and that encourages this kind of repetition of actions, doesn't it? With the scrolling, with the searching. Sometimes I know I've run out of things to search for. I think I've got to find something else to search for. You know, there are the you do kind of go into a different sort of frame of mind i think and what he compares us to is kind of lab rats where we're constantly pressing levers or maybe pressing the search key um, to get tiny pellets of information but we never stop on one piece of information 
we just move on so quickly to the next that we don't really think. And I know that I have liked things and shared things and I had to go back and go, actually, what did I just share? What did I just like? I need to check that. I need to check what the source is for that. I need to check what that user is about. I know I've, I've done that. So really what we kind of conclude is that it's not all bad. First of all, distraction is really important for, for us and for our brains. And also the internet engages a lot of our brain more than if we're just sitting and, and reading a book. And that can be really good, uh, especially in older people. It can engage and, and, and kind of exercise a lot more of the brain. But this constant like, evaluating links, nav navigating, kind of prevents us from engaging in any kind of understanding and deep learning of what we're looking at. I want to just briefly go on to sort of um, COVID-19 and the effects that that's had on the media, I think. So I think it's clear, especially uh, for, for people who are watching in the UK, that the mainstream media has played a really large supportive role, in the early, especially in the early stages of COVID. So, for instance, 27 million people watched Boris Johnson when he did his lockdown broadcast. 27 million. I mean, those are kind of figures that are going back to the 1970s in the, in the UK for, for sort of TV audiences. Um, mainstream media trust is twice what it is on, on social networks. So people trust TV, especially. Um, and kind of mainstream media twice as much as they as they trust sort of social media. So I think there has been this kind of turnaround, How, whether this is uh, permanent, I don't know, but there is suddenly this kind of belief that mainstream media, especially television, especially local news, those are kind of the most trusted areas really, and the BBC. But Nick Newman, who kind of um, put together, it was part of a, a survey, um, those, where those figures that I've just uh, shown you came from. Um, he says, you know, as disagreements resurface about the best way to manage the recovery, so shall we wear masks, shall we not? Is, is you know, is opening shops, is that about, is that putting our safety, you know, is it economy before uh, safety of, um, of the population? So any of this sort of, this distrust halo could be quite short-lived. Um, when we look at trust in the media, Overall, the UK trust in the news media is at an all-time low. It's at 28%. 28%. It's like three quarters of people don't trust the news media in this country. And because we're so polarised in our views, sort of leave and remain over Brexit, I think was a really pushed a lot of this to kind of distrust in the media. Brands and platforms are seen as pushing or suppressing agendas because the new because as publications, we've also got to. In, in some respects, give our readers what they want, especially in digital age where we want people to engage. So it's, you know, is your, is your paper for Brexit, is it against? There's no kind of grey areas, it's all polarising issues. Um, and again, this erodes trust in, in publications. But it doesn't just happen in the US, it happens all over and it happens across the political spectrum. And what I want to share with you and ask you in a minute what your opinion is on it is, We've got an article here from the Daily Express, which was a story about the Home Secretary, the, the Home Secretary Priti Patel, warning about rule breakers. This was uh, a front page in the Daily Express from the end of April. And to illustrate this, the paper used uh, an image of people on the beachfront in Brighton to suggest that they were kind of breaking social distancing rules. I mean, now. I don't think that image looks that shocking, but I think when we were kind of in the midst of, of lockdown, I think it, it, I think it was a really shocking image. Um, and this is what someone tweeted about it. This is a person who lived in Brighton and he said, I'm here every day. It doesn't look like this. He also went on to say that the cranes in the image aren't there, that they were there last year. He said, you know, this, this photograph wasn't taken during lockdown. It's, it's dishonest. Um, and then there began this huge argument on Facebook and this big kind of um, building up of a case to show that it was fake. So there was arguments about the shadows. The shadows are in the wrong place for the time of year. Um, the cranes weren't there anymore. And it was actually uh, Ipso, which is the independent press um, organization, the press complaints organization, received 22 complaints about the misuse of the image. And 3,000 people retweeted that, that claim that it, was, that it was fake. 
And Paula, if we can just, if I could just ask everybody, Paula, if you can have a look, I just wanted to ask you all if, if you think this image is, is real or fake. So if people could just put real, if they think that that's a genuine image taken in April, or fake if they think that's a picture from another time of year that the Express have used. I'm just, I don't need numbers, but I'd just be interested to see kind of what the balance is and what people think. I'm keeping an eye out. I've got two fake and one real so far. <laughs> <laughs> Four fake, one real. Um, five fake, two real. Six fake, two real. Okay. So I know I'm running a little bit over. So I think that I think that um, I think maybe that shows a balance that uh, I can go with. Okay, that's really that's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks for the people that responded. Um, so Ipso rejected the complaints. Because it's real. That image was taken on the 23rd of April 2020 in Brighton. It wasn't fake. Um, and we know that it wasn't fake because the news agency editor published the original image and the metadata, which showed when the photograph was taken, what time of day it was taken, what the exposure was. Um, all of that information was published on Twitter on the same day that the person said, I don't believe this is real. And what I found really interesting was the response that happened after that, which was people wouldn't accept it, they would not accept it. They accused the picture editor of falsifying the metadata. His response, we think that, they, that, that the, false, the false accusation, the accusation that actually turned out to be fake news was shared 3,000 times. His response was only shared 22 times. And we have to ask, you know, do, do we actually want the truth? We've got to a point where we've forgotten the purpose of news so much that we no longer want the truth if it challenges our beliefs. What I also found interesting is that the original tweet came from someone from the, whose, whose political uh, position was to the left. And the people who were supporting him when I had a look through, they were also people who were to the left. So these accusations of fake news don't just come from the right. They come from across the political spectrum. And when I thought about it, people had taken so much time to measure these shadows, to convince themselves that it must be false because, because the people of Brighton care too much and, and, and they won't go out and they won't break social distancing rules. And people had put so much time and effort into it. People had actually gone down there, gone down to the same spot and looked at the shadows. And it's very hard to face these facts. But as I said, that goes back to what the purpose of news actually is. It's not to make us happy. It's not to agree or disagree with us or to feed into our biases or not. It's to show us the truth. And that can be ugly and it can be things that we don't want to see. Um, so I just thought it was really interesting. Um, not only the, the accusation that was made, but also the, the response from the people who had made those accusations. I just want to finish on a couple of slides. Um, apologies, Paula, that I've gone over. I hope you can forgive me. Um, so. I really like this, this quote from David Lee, a journalist. I think this, uh, this, he wrote this in 2007, but I think it relates to, the, to the, 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 the piece that I've just shown you, which is the internet degrades valuable things. The idea that some voices are more credible than others. Yeah, so it's almost, for me as a journalist, I've lost my credibility. It's kind of gone um, because if I post on Twitter and someone else posts on Twitter, our posts look the same. Mine doesn't seem more important than that other person's. No one can see the 10 sources that I've checked. You know, that, that's kind of invisible when, you, when you're dealing with social media. And then also the notion of authoritativeness is derided as a sort of top-down fascism. So people weren't prepared to ex accept the word of, of an expert, of someone who is a professional, in this case, the news editor. People weren't prepared to take his word. Um, it was kind of meaningless. And he said here, you know, I feel that these developments will endanger the role of the reporter, but I think it's, it's further than that. It's not only the role of the reporter, it's kind of journalism itself. But having said that, 
Um, I really like this quote from Alan Rusbridger, who's a former editor of The Guardian, who says, in theory, the complete answer to fake news should be journalism. Um, and I think what he means by that is that we need to come back somehow. We need to come back to that normative theory of journalism. We keep trying to do it as journalists, but it's also like audiences and readers need to come back to that realisation. And I think there is some good news. Um, I mean, Facebook is considering banning all political ads. Twitter has already banned all political ads because it's so difficult to work out what is true. We talked about this disinformation. Um, the BBC now has a disinformation department and it has specialist reporters who, who come on to kind of challenge fake news. Um, there's a reporter called Mariana Sprigg, you might have Spring, who comes up quite a lot on, um, on news bulletins now. And also I think which is what is something that's really um, and it gives us hope for the future is that kind of in the UK pupils from key stage three which is from the age of 11 are going to be taught about information bias and by that that is being drawn to facts or being drawn to information that supports your view uh, and also about fake news so I think there I think there is I think there is hope um, and we have to remember you know just just finally to you know, that, that that journalism is a mirror it's not um, it's not there to make us feel good or bad or to support our arguments necessarily. Um, it, it, it's there as a mirror and it can sometimes be uncomfortable. Um, so that's it. Um, are there any questions? Thank you. <laughs> oh, and also, if anyone's brought, um, I know I ask people to bring along examples of fake news. Um, so I don't know if you're able to perhaps look and see if uh, if your if your stories kind of met the the fake news and the news kind of um, criteria uh, maybe that's something you, you want to look at um because i forgot to mention it so i do apologize <laughs> okay. Thank um, you very much, Lynn. that was absolutely fascinating that's Thank okay you. sorry i ran over i do apologize no, don't worry that was so good I've, need, I've normally got students that i can see in here to tell me to shut up so <laughs> no I've, uh, everybody has stayed and i think <laughs> really interested so we've got a comment first of all from um fion who says lynn i'm a sociology undergraduate and this is so relevant to me and mm. to my personal interests uh, so thank you very much oh that's great um, and lizzie um says was this the same image where there were issues with the lens the photographer was using make, making people they look were Together. There were accusations of that, saying that the um, yeah, the, I mean, there's a whole. If you go, if, if people want to look at a uh, full fact, it, uh, if you just type in full fact into Google, you'll find loads of information there because they've actually got a section on different lenses and the way that you can have people standing really far apart and lenses can make people look as though they're standing much, much, much closer together than than they actually are. Um, and so that could that would have been a whole other lecture in itself <laughs> that's the thing with this subject is it's huge but yeah that's that's right Lizzie yeah I think there were some issues over over lenses yeah yeah and I think that might have been true in Bournemouth as well was it because mm. there was a lots of photos from Bournemouth Beach yeah. okay thank you and then uh, another comment from Beverly just saying really interesting thank you very much oh, that's fine. so I don't know if anybody else would like to comment or post a question now for Lynn. Have I been so good that I've just answered any questions that anyone might well, have I ever heard so. about fake news? I think so, definitely. <laughs> Let's give people just a yeah, sure, that's fine. Little bit of time. I think it's really hopeful when you say that um, education is the key, isn't it, moving forward and educating young people yeah i think it's education but i think it's also this kind of relation realization or rediscovery of what journalism is actually for yeah because now i think another uh, another thing that, that nicholas cast is in his book is that we don't see the wood we don't see the trees or we see are leaves and twigs and we see the leaves and twigs that we want to see um and we just kind of spread those little bits of information around mm. um and I think it can be very difficult to get to get the whole picture. It's a difficult yeah. thing to do, but really the, the only way to do it is to look is to look across a, a variety of publications that have got different ideologies and different political perspectives. It's the only way to kind of, you know, get a kind of broader view and a more accurate view of, of what's what's going on really. Yes. It is, it yeah. is 
Um, we've had a, a, a flurry of questions and comments now. Mm. Um, Kay says, really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Oh, uh, thanks, Kay. Um, and um, Star Wilkes says, Lynn, thank you for that informative lecture. Really interesting stuff. I found a post around a month ago surrounding the Black Lives Matter protests, pictures of police being abused, and many of those were fake. That's they, right. Yeah, they're from other. Yeah, I've come across those as well. Yeah. They're from other events or yeah, yeah. yeah things that um, happened several years ago. Or different Robinson places. protest in 2015, he believes. Mm. Um, so don't quote me. Um, so there's another example. Um, Anonymous says, do you agree with Carr's arguments or is he a bit too negative? Right. I think he's right. I think when I when I read his book, it suddenly kind of made sense to me because I think I don't know if other people can relate to what I was saying about that. The different state that you go into when you're scrolling or when you're online, you, you, you're in a different you're in a different place completely. I think we see it as distraction and then sometimes don't take responsibility or, or don't think enough about what we do share and what we do click on and what we do like and just, as I say sometimes I've had to go back and go actually what what was that thing that I clicked on what was that thing that I liked should I should I have liked that I don't you know I haven't looked at that that person's profile and so now I, I do I do agree yeah um okay. unfortunately okay. it's quite sad it's quite depressing isn't it but I think I think he's right and I think it just just means that we need to kind of reassess um how we treat information and uh, that we see online and, and take a bit more responsibility for how we kind of spread it and share it really. Okay, thank you. Another comment from Leah th saying, thank you, Lynn, that was great. Oh, thank you. Um, Lauren Newman, it's very hard to think of anything to ask. You haven't already answered Lynn. <laughs> I Thanks, will be all my mindful of what I'm sharing now. now. Mm. So that's really good. Mary says, thanks, Lynn, that was fascinating and I hadn't thought about so much of what you've said. Given that this is potentially destroying journalism and the role of journalists, mm. should they do something to focus on the reason why fake news feeds on negative emotions and the need to hate mm. um, others and discredit people? No idea how, but perhaps they need to be focusing on the fears driving the hate. Yeah, I think, I think in this country it's definitely, I think... Um, I think these these things were there before, but I think Brexit really kept brought it to the surface because I know the day after you're kind of walking around going, who who was for and who was against, who voted leave and who voted remain and what are they a remainer or are they a leaver and it it seemed to polarise everyone so much. Um, it seems now like you can't just accept someone else's opinion. You can't go actually I don't agree. You know I don't agree with you, but I respect your opinion. Now it's it, if it doesn't if, if someone doesn't agree with you, then it's kind of it can't possibly be real. It can't be true because it doesn't feed into what you want to have in your little bubble. And um, I think social media has had a, a a lot to do with that, really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, Angela um, says, oh, sorry, just did. Um, this was so interesting. Thank you. Do you think that new technologies have a part to play in citizen journalism? Yeah, I mean, citizen journalism is really important. Uh, and especially, you know, when I started out as a print journalist, the paper came out once a week. So it was wonderful. <laughs> we could go back to those days, whereas now we've got a rolling 24 hour deadline. And so the role of citizen journalism, journalism, especially with breaking stories, if there's been some sort of disaster, if there's been a terrorist incident, quite often citizen journalists can be there. You know, they can be there on the street at the time and then we can actually use their use their material. So from the point of view of, of, of professional journalism, then citizen journalism is, is really important. Um, with regards to fake news, it doesn't seem to kind of tie in with that that much. I mean, yeah, obviously you know that the, the use of mobile phones now means that you know i've gone out and filmed things for, for news bulletins on, on a mobile phone so it, it's kind of changed everything but um citizen journalism is, is really really important um plays a really important role i think if that answers your question mm -hmm. um, yeah thank you and um from jenna a great lecture where you were able to debunk and demystify a lot of issues surrounding fake news it was really interesting to hear your views on how fake news feeds into people's own narrative mm. and biases. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Thank you. So, um, um, and then, Alan, what's your comment based on your experience 
on how to identify and track fake news, especially when being spread using encrypted media such as WhatsApp and, te and Telegram. I've got no idea. Um, this is the problem, you know, you kind of, as soon as you come up with, this is how you identify on Facebook, this is how you identify on Twitter, then there's new forms of, of, of fake news. I mean, the, the, I don't know, I'd, I've got to say, Alan, I don't, I'm not really an expert. I know what, I know there's a, um, I know WhatsApp is a big issue now. Uh, it's not something that I've looked at yet. Um, mm. I know there's things like deep fakes, if anyone's heard of those, where you've actually got video content that people kind of map their face and then they can put that onto, link that to the face of Trump and make him say things. And it, it looks exactly mm. like him. So you, you have like false videos. Um, and then more recently, you've got, um, you're not just talking about fake news anymore, but you've got fake journalists, you've got fake profiles, and mm. those profiles can't be traced on Google, Google image search because they're created by bots. And so they take elements of lots of people's faces and put them together. They have fake articles that they've written, and that's mm. used in order to put um, you know, opinion pieces into, into various newspapers. So there's just every time you think you've got a handle on it, there's just some more technology that comes along. And, and even if that's not widespread, as soon as people are aware of it, again, it makes them doubt what they're reading and what they're seeing. Mm. If you're watching a grainy video of, of a politician saying something, how do you how do you know if that's real? How do you mm. know that's real or fake? You know, how do you know that a journalist is real or fake? And as soon as you're aware that they're out there, then it it, it also casts doubt because a lot of times I've seen things and it as soon as you've got a seed of as soon as there's like a, just a little bit of doubt in your mind about whether what you're looking at is real or not, um, it starts to undermine it and it starts to un undermine again um, that trust in the news. I think. Yes. Thank you. Um, Star Wilkes says deep fakes are terrifying, which I think we, we would all agree with. Um, Helen says, thanks, Lynn. Extremely informative. Opens up a discussion to have with my children in the future. This lecture will be very helpful. Oh, uh, don't, don't put them through that, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> what have um, they done? <laughs> And Angela says, um, yes, that did answer my question. Oh, Thank you very much. Your lecture will really make me think twice about what I like and share. Mm. Back checking and calling it out are very important and being aware. Yeah, of your I, I think that calling it out is really important. And that's why um, sites like uh, Full Factor are fantastic. Um, because to be able to go back, and it's quite difficult because on, on Facebook, I've had to do it with kind of, um, with, with people that I know quite well and, and then post the sort of full fat link and you don't know what kind of response you're going to get. But I think if people keep doing it, then it will, it will make people think, you know, but I think it's really good to be able to have something that you can do to be kind of proactive and go, you shouldn't be doing this and this isn't real and, and make people, you know, stop and think. And yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, it's very important. Mm. Thank you. That's brilliant. I think that's all. 18 questions answered so um fantastic thank you ever so much lynn that was really fascinating no, no really at all. thank you very much and and thanks thank everyone for attending um yeah. it's very strange for me to not be able to see or hear anybody no it is it is very weird. <laughs> but um hopefully you uh you all enjoyed it and uh, appreciate you staying till the end and taking part and asking your questions thank you yes and another thank you from stephanie just to, to oh, thank you stephanie <laughs> thank you to everyone for attending and we look yeah, forward thank to you. seeing you again. Thank you, Lynn. Okay. Bye-bye. No bye bye. Okay, bye. Everybody. Bye.